Another thing I think that predisposed us to is sort of a different way of understanding our marriage. You know, when we were talking about marriage and marriage was coming onto the table conversationally, we were both very clear about not wanting to have a sense of ownership of each other. And we were very much wanting to have kind of an egalitarian connection that wasn't based on strict gender roles. Um, and we were also talking about marriage is not a thing that you just assume is going to last forever. And if we change and grow and evolve, that maybe that construct changes too. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from all over the world to hear their personal journeys of self-discovery through the lenses of love, sex, and relationships. Our mission is to show people that they're not alone and to inspire them to embrace their true selves so that together we can open minds and live authentically without shame. We believe everyone's story is powerful and beautiful, yet it's important to remember that everyone does life a little bit differently and that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we aren't doctors. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Well, welcome to episode 312. We're Finn and Emma, and today we are honored and excited to have Jessica Fern and David Cooley on for our interview today. They are the co-authors of the new book, Polly Wise, that came out just a few months ago. And you also may recognize Jessica Fern as the author of Polly Secure. We're so excited to talk to them today. They have been in relationship for over 20 years. It's taken many different forms, and they dig into it all with us today. Yeah, and uh, as Emma said, super excited about this conversation today, and the way that these two are so able to dig into the journey that they've been on and all of the different variations and iterations that relationship has looked like for the two of them, and how they've landed where they did today, and and, and, and. And, and, right. How they keep doing the work together to continue to co-create a beautiful life. And then how they use that experience and their experience and their work to write amazing and create amazing resources for, for all of us who are out here navigating the world, honestly, alongside them. And I think mm-hmm. that's what's so amazing about this is this, this interview is really their story and their journey individually and together. And so I'm excited to get the the behind the scenes look. Yeah, it's amazing. And we also want to say thank you to both of them for all of the amazing work that you've done. And a reminder that you can check out links to their works in the show notes. Also, we wanted to thank both of them for their patience with this interview. We did this interview on Labor Day about two months ago, and we've had a backlog. And we just want to really acknowledge and appreciate their patience in us getting this out there. We call that anticipation. Yes. <laughs> or anticipations. Sure. I, I made that up sure. right now. New word. Yeah. Anyway, I also wanted to say one quick disclaimer or note about the audio quality. There is a bit of a scratchy mic for the first five minutes when David is talking. We correct that. So it's I've, I've eliminated as much as possible in the first few minutes, and it's completely eliminated throughout the entire interview, just those first couple of minutes. So we heard it. We got you. It's all good. Thank you again, Jessica and David, for everything. For anyone who is a premium subscriber, we're going to jump right into the interview with both of them now. And for anyone else, we are going to go through our announcements. First up, if you're not familiar with the premium subscription, you hear us, if you hear these announcements, talk about it every week. It is a way to skip these announcements up front, jump right into the interview, but don't worry, you still get important dates in the outro. To sign up, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, scroll down on the homepage, and you will find links to sign up for the premium subscription right there. And while you're on our homepage, if you go up to the top navigation bar, we've got a new place for you to go. And that is under the podcast tab, there is one that says, Ask Us anything. We released our first Ask Us Anything episode just a few days ago, last Friday. October 27th. October 27th, where I came on with Miche and we answered a few listener questions that were sent in and we had a great time. Yeah. And Miche is a relationship coach working with Expansive Connection. We're super excited for this partnership. So we're not going to tell you more about that here because we're trying to keep it fast, but please go check that out. You can send us a question. We will answer it on the air. And we would love, love, love to have you do that. We answer those once a month. So there is more information on how to do that. Again, on our website, click on the podcast tab and then ask us anything. 
While you're there, you can also sign up for our next virtual meet and greet. It is going to be on November 17th. That's a Friday evening. We would love to have you join us. These virtual meet and greets are open to anyone. You just must be open-minded and respectful. We have a super fun time utilizing the Zoom breakout rooms and giving you questions to talk about with one another. And we scramble the rooms so you get to meet as many people as possible for the evening. Uh, They're a lot of fun, and we would love for you to go sign up. Again, links under the events tab on our website. The next thing up is we want to tell you a little bit about our virtual community or our community that we've been running and building for the last four years or so. Mm -hmm. And it is 2019. It's absolutely incredible, but we're not going to tell you about it today. We're going to let one of our community members tell you a little bit about it. And I will say they also talk a little bit about how amazing the podcast is. And so thank you in advance, Judy, for sending us this and for all of your kind words and all of your contributions to everything we do. You are one of the backbones of our community. So thank you. Hi, this is Judy. And I just wanted to say that the Normalizing Non-Monogamy podcast is one of the best podcasts on polyamory that I've heard. Uh, This was the first place that my husband and I got our education when we first were starting to think about joining the lifestyle several years ago. And this podcast has something that I think none of the other podcasts have, and that it's not got a lot of experts. It's real people talking about their real everyday experiences in ethical non-monogamy. And I think that sets it apart from a lot of the other podcasts. Finn and Emma are so knowledgeable and welcoming and supportive. And this community is also very welcoming. I would encourage you to listen to every episode and to join the community. You won't be sorry that you did. Thank you again, Judy, for this amazing feedback and testimonial. We are super grateful. And I just wanted to, to add one quick note to this, which is she, she mentioned how our podcast episodes are full of real people telling their real stories and their real experiences. And honestly, that is what the community is. It is full of real people, many of whom have actually been on the show or come on the show after they're part of the community. And they're in there sharing their real experiences as well. And so it is a really great place to just not be alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We encourage you, highly encourage you to check it out. Go to our website, again, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the community tab. You can find out all of the information there. And last but not least, we want to do a quick shout out for our favorite way to get tested for STIs. It is stdcheck.com. It is the way that Finn and I get tested, and it is super fast and discreet and simple, amazing. Oh, it's wonderful. And... and- and Emma. What? When you use the links on our website, you save $10, which makes it hella affordable at only $129 for a 10 panel test. And when you do that, you help support the show financially. Yes. Thank you so much in advance for using those links. And a quick reminder to find those links. You go to our resources tab (laughs) and you will see all of the resources that Emma and I use, but links will be in there as well or in your podcast player show notes. I didn't mean to step over you, but I I think you were just about to forget to tell them where to go. Yeah, I was. I was. It's all good. (laughs) I was going to say, while you're on our website, send us a voicemail, send us an email. We'd love to hear from you if you want to be a guest on the podcast or just have you count any questions, feedback for us. We would love to hear from you. And with that, let's go and talk with Jessica and David. Welcome, David and Jessica, to the podcast. We're excited to talk with you today. Thank you so much for being here. We would love for you to start by introducing yourselves at whatever level you're comfortable with. All right, why don't you go ahead, Jessica? You're the headliner. (laughs) I'm Jessica Fern. I'm a psychotherapist and a relationship coach and the author of PolySecure and the co-author with David of PolyWise. Love it. Welcome. And David... I'm David Cooley. I'm the creator of the restorative relationship conversation model and process. Um, So I facilitate private sessions for clients who are struggling with interpersonal conflict, whatever that may look like. And also, yeah, as Jessica said, the co-author of PolyWise. Wonderful. Yes. Well, we'd want to dive into all of the work for sure, but we'd love to start and Maybe have you both share a little bit about what your relationship with non-monogamy is right now. And maybe your relationship with each other too would be a great place to start. Yeah. Our relationship with each other is um, 20, 21 years now, this November. 
and we've had many iterations. We dated, we stopped dating, we were friends, <laughs> we got married, we have a child together, we got divorced and um, lived apart, and now we live back together. We are creative partners and, you know, um, I would use the term poly intimates where we're not in a sexual relationship together, but um, calling each other exes or just co-parents doesn't, you know, even capture the level of intimacy and depth and home life that we have every day. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. I just want to say that that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. It's like, I'm excited to dive in, but that's a very great high level overview. Yeah. Yeah. And you can get yeah. specifics. <laughs> and part of that reality is that we live together. So we live in the same house. And so we co-parent together in the same space, um, which adds another obviously layer of intimacy to that process. I think my favorite definition of us now is life partners. Yeah. Um, which really, that seems to really fit. Yeah. I love that. It's interesting. The way you just described that we, we have somebody in our community who is in somewhat of a very similar situation. They got married, they had a child, their partner came out as gay. They've decided to stay together but they are now co-parenting and living together and they posted in our community what what do we call ourselves and the term i threw out just haphazardly was a nesting co-parent because they were like well yeah. being just saying co-parents doesn't really capture it saying that we're partners it sort of captures it but not really but i don't like to say that she's my ex because there was like this whole list of things and so we were, he was trying on the term nesting co-parent and I don't know <laughs> if that like, but I love that you're like life partner. Yeah. yeah I like simple. nesting co-parent also fits. Yeah. Yeah. But we had someone recently who was like, oh, should I call you two exes? And I was like, no, that privileges our marriage over our, and the divorce, which is so not the center of our relationship at all. Yeah. 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 I love that. And I'm, I'm really excited to dig into all that because I love just what seems like fluidity of allowing your relationship to be what it is. But I also have to imagine it wasn't quite as easy <laughs> as it, as it rolled out in a 30 second, like my, uh, you know, segment there. So 21 years and 30 seconds. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so maybe backing up to the beginning for the two of you, what did, what did the relationship look like at the beginning? And when did non-monogamy first come into the picture for the two of you. Why don't you start, Dave? Yeah, I mean, the, the beginning of the relationship, we sort of, I think we touch on just very briefly in one of the parts of the book. I think it's where we name our biases. Yeah, I talk about how we were both sort of refugees from the East Coast. Um, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating with that use of the word, but we were at a residential massage school in Northern California, and it was a very different environment. We both sought out that environment intentionally, but it was very different from where we had come from. And so it was kind of a place where East Coasters really stood out like sore thumbs and felt kind of a lot of culture shock. So we found each other and kind of clung together. It was like, oh, I heard your accent. You're clearly from Upper East Coast. Where are you from? Oh, awesome. Oh, thank God. You think and speak the way I do, and we can laugh about some of this silly shit that we see around us. Um, and so we were bound through necessity, but I think as we just started to connect intellectually, there was just a really powerful um, just synergy of thinking, alignment of personal values uh, that was really salient from the very, very beginning. I think one of our first sort of not date, but like hanging out sessions was like this three and a half hour walk around the campus of the school. And it was just, it just, it was so stimulating and so inspiring and so connective. It really, it, it stood out for me. I hadn't had an experience like that. And it was really the beginning. And like Jessica said, we sort of had a very quick romantic start. And then I actually got really bugged out by how much and how deeply and how fast that was happening. And I, I was the one to kind of pull the plug on that. And then we, that was sort of a hard first transition for us back into friendship, but it's sort of, we survived that. And then it was friends for a really long time. And it wasn't until I'm 46 now, it wasn't until I was close to 30 that um, we actually sort of moved back into a partnership space and then we were married for how many years before? I mean, we were kind of like seven or eight years at that point. We had had Diego. He was about two-ish, 
Yeah, we were my sense of our sense of time is off. But yeah, we had we had at least a good five years of I think monogamy and then opened up our marriage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we were, yeah, so we had been married, we had a good foundation, you know, and we had had over a decade of friendship. So we had seen each other in other relationships as friends and supported each other through that process. So there was already sort of a context for that. Having intellectual and emotional intimacy is something that was just always been the baseline for our connection. So we had that while knowing that the other person is in a romantic connection with someone else. So that really allowed when we first started interfacing with ideas of, of non-monogamy, it was like, okay, yeah, we already kind of do that in, in terms of the emotional and intellectual intimacy. Right. We, th- we thought we could do it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that's amazing to, to touch on that though, that in some ways you were almost doing non-monogamy before you were doing non-monogamy, right? You were the support system for each other as you were, I think because what right people often think of non-monogamy, the initial steps are we're going to take our monogamous partnership and we're going to probably introduce sex with other people. And it seems like you two sort of introduced relationships with other people while you were a very tight knit friend and support unit, which is seemingly sort of where you are maybe at today, probably obviously with some nuance, but that you've sort of, you did that before you did it in the quote unquote official way. Yeah, I think so. There was sort of a version or a a foundation that was already laid, you know, like when we weren't before we were together, um, before we got married, I think each time one of us would like go through a breakup, we'd call each other and process it, (laughs) you know? So a lot of that was already there. Yeah. You had that established, like you dated for a little bit and then you had that established friendship and for, for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It really helped. So what what brought you two back together and then set you off on the trajectory to marriage? Um, And maybe what took you then from the monogamous marriage into an official exploration? I know official is such a weird word. Super simple question, by the way. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Dave, you take what got us together into marriage. I'll take the what opened us up. Sounds good. Yeah, so as I was approaching my 30s, I was really starting to hit a wall with my previous career. I was a chef, professional chef, super unhappy in it. You know, I was just been in the, the industry for way too long. Um, and I was starting to kind of feel the emptiness of it. And and for me and needing a change on multiple levels, wasn't fulfilled kind of in any aspect of my life and was starting to have this realization that none of my relationships were fulfilling in a way that I wanted them to be. So it's kind of hitting this, this existential crisis. And I noticed that I was holding up everyone that I was dating to Jessica. Like, so I had Jessica, I, I hadn't thought of her as partner potential in a long time. I mean, we had kind of had some, even after we had transitioned into friends, there were some starts and stops where it was like, there's so much chemistry here, maybe, but it was just never the right time. And we'd talk about it and touch on it. And then be like, no, not now, you know, so it's strange like that. But I noticed unconsciously at some point that I was, they're not Jessica. Like that's, I've already got someone who I know this is the standard. How could I settle for less? And then I had this journey um, in the mountains. I went with some friends and and had kind of a spiritual process and saw Jessica and I together in a vision. And was just like, why am I holding her up here and not going for it? And so I remember driving. It was like five in the morning. I had to be at work in like two hours driving down from the mountains. And I called Jessica and I want to try us. And she was like, great, prove it. (laughs) <laughs> she knows she knew me really well. Um, and so she knew that she was going to have to see follow through and not just me be really stoked in a moment of inspiration and spiritual illumination after, you know, a retreat like that. So it was great. She tested me and, and thankfully I, I, I met the challenge. And so we started really kind of getting back into that, that cycle of, of partnership and attachment formation. Um, obviously not thinking of it in those terms, and we were dating, not dating. I mean, we're just kind of connecting long distance. She was in Denver. I was in Virginia. And within, I mean, six months tops, if it was even that, 
I was like, I'm out of this job. I don't need this shit. Let's do it. And so I flew to Denver to be with her in her little apartment, um, which back in those days was affordable. And <laughs> we were just really jumping into living together for, for the first time ever. Um, and we were together about eight, eight months or so before getting married. Um, and I remember thinking before doing that, I was like sort of soothing myself. Like, ah, we'll be together for two years living together. We'll really like work, iron out the kinks and then we'll get married. Then we'll start talking about getting married. <laughs> so it was sort of, it was interesting sort of the way that we, that cycle was accelerated, um, after mm-hmm. we got together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like even from the very first time you two met, the level of intensity that brings you two together is seems to be a force that is tough to reckon with. Yes. Yeah. It is. There's a karmic, you know, I have mixed feelings about the word karmic connections, but I think it feels very applicable in, in this, this context. Yeah. 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 And then we were together for several years before we had our son and I think it was a combination of things. Well, even when we were first getting together before marriage, because the serious relationship I was in before Dave and I got married was with a woman. So we did have conversations of like, can I be monogamous if I'm not straight? You know, like us sort of bringing that to the table. And I had previously had times of being non-monogamous. So are we assuming this? You know, that it was sort of a, the conversation was there. It wasn't completely on there. But we kind of defaulted into monogamy as well and assumed yeah. it. And it was it did coincide with this, like, after pregnancy and starting to ovulate again. <laughs> and, like, a lot of my physiology and biology really changing. And then as a therapist, having this one, and I've talked about this before, but having this sort of one week where all of my couple's clients brought in non-monogamy. And so that just bringing, you know, coming home and talking with Dave about it and us just being like, should we try this? Let's do it. You know? Um, and it was, it was different. It was more polyamory actually that we were really, you know, opening up to and claiming and coming out as versus previous times of me being more on the non-monogamous umbrella. Yeah. Yeah. You're actually potentially seeking out other relation, other romantic other love. Yeah. And yeah, that's what love. drew us most. I mean, we were both excited about having sex with different people too, but it was really, we both felt this, like we already do this. We love people so deeply and like, we have the capacity to love more than one person. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> was, was non-monogamy a construct that it sounded like Jessica, you had done it before in some way, or may, or maybe I misinterpreted that. I did, but it wasn't a construct I was aware of. It was just the thing that happened. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was that's thing, so common, right? Yeah, it was so common yeah. that, you know, even at 14 years old, just like, you know, these little kissing parties that we'd have with other girls or guys and girls, you know, where it just, we weren't completely monogamous or exclusive. Um, yeah. um, same thing in college. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't a explicit word that was being used. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 How about how about for you, Dave? No, there was no non-monogamous um, experiences really um, up to that point. But what was interesting is thinking about the way that we thought about, like I said, um, emotional and intellectual mature um, intimacy. Excuse me. And you know, as you start to read some of the books. Um, and hear people talk about the experiences and that, that idea of what for so many people is challenging is to see their partner be intimately connected to someone th- emotionally or, uh, or intellectually is this like this huge triggering thing. And so for us, it was like, that's wouldn't be the case because we've always had, even while married, she's had close guy friends. I've had close female friends. Most of my friends are, are women, um, in general. And so it was just this thing that just felt like a no brainer from that standpoint, there was a lot we didn't see or consider. Um, but from that standpoint, I think there was sort of a way of really resonating with the principles and the philosophy that we were starting to absorb as we were getting exposed to the culture. Another thing I think that predisposed us to is sort of a different way of understanding our marriage. You know, when we we're talking about marriage and marriage is coming onto the table conversationally. 
we were both very clear about not wanting to have a sense of ownership of each other. And we were very much wanting to have kind of an egalitarian connection that wasn't based on strict gender roles. Um, and we were also talking about marriage is not a thing that you just assume is going to last forever. And if we change and grow and evolve, that maybe that construct changes too. And that was the irony of that for me, especially thinking about kind of the ruptures that we experienced after we did open is that that was a safety mechanism for my own attachment fears around commitment was thinking, Oh, if we can, if we need to get out of this, we can get out, meaning I can get yeah, out. Sure, okay. <laughs> but, yeah. right, totally. So it's funny to reflect on that, but I think the, at least the, those first pieces around, yeah, what is marriage really to us were flexible and sort of open for conversation in a way that I don't hear as many people, or I didn't hear back then, at least as many people talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's so far, I think we're making it sound like it was easy. The, the lead up before we opened was really easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's great walks and conversations. We were aligned. We were ready. We were confident. And then the reality of it, especially the first few months, few weeks was, was it, can I say it just a disaster? Was it, like, it, was, it was, it was, it was painful. It was really painful. Yeah. 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 And not, I mean, more for Dave, right? Initially I found it easy. I found someone to connect with pretty quickly. I was like, this is incredible. <laughs> I'm like loving this, right? And and it was the complete opposite experience for Dave. Yeah, and there's reasons for that. I mean, there's kind of multi multiple reasons for that. I don't have to go into those right now if you've got other questions, but Well, no, I think it would be it would be wonderful e- even just to touch on them a little bit because yeah, the so common. Yeah, the idea of I mean even coming into it thinking like we could do this, right? You kind of stepped back and assessed, you talked about it, you went on the long walks. You seemingly even went into it with like some type of a plan and yeah. then it was the not that I love quoting Mike Tyson, but everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. And like, that is something we hear so often is like, we thought it was going to be amazing. We, it was going to be like this and then we did it and it was nothing like we thought it was going to be. And all of these things came up that we weren't expecting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think part of the, one of the main differences between us is Jessica's background. Is it okay if I talk about that, Jessica, in the context of this? Yeah. Yeah, And so, you know, Jessica grew up in a household where her father wasn't there and her mother had, um, you know, many different partners. Um, you know, she went through a series of marriages and, and then boyfriends in between those marriages. And so the, influx of of different men in your life really created uh, a template for transitions are normal people come in and out of your life yeah you know, and, and attachment was experienced very differently and and one of the amazing things about some of those men that have come into your life they're still there um one in particular who is just like this is one of the most amazing people i've ever met like he still sends me a hundred dollars on my birthday. <laughs> like, and like, you know, it's like he stopped dating her mother when she was a teenager. He's still my <laughs> dad. He's still and my he, dad. And he is like, we <laughs> call him uncle, blah, 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 you know, and, no, and, to our son, and that's, that's how our son sees him. <laughs> yeah. and it's like, yeah. the love is so beautiful and just, tr- it's just so, I love you for who you are between the two of them. And it's just, it's, it's touched me and, and I feel gratitude for that. So I think, that's a long-winded way of saying her template was so different. Whereas I, my parents are still together. They just, they just celebrated their 55th anniversary. Right. And and there's sort of a reverse story happening there. It's like, I'm the first person in my nuclear family to get a divorce. You know, some people say, oh, I'm the first one in my family to go to go to college. Like that's flipped <laughs> now. It's like, I'm the first one to ever be divorced, you know? And it's, it's, I just didn't, it, it just wasn't, in my sphere of anticipation. So that was a big difference. Well, I think, and what my, cause on the surface, it looked like I came from the broken childhood and all these losses and all these um, people coming and going. But what it allowed for me was to, I knew how to do multiple universes. Cause you know, I'd have to go to three different families on Christmas. Right. So I had the ability to pivot really quickly from like one family to another. And so I had no clue that now we're non-monogamous, we're polyamorous. I'm like, oh, I know how to navigate different 
intimate realities really easily, actually. Whereas, yeah, that wasn't a skill set that Dave had cultivated for him from his childhood. Yeah. And you had also done a lot of personal work. I mean, you got into the business of therapy and kind of self-growth way early, um, at least from my standpoint. Um, and part of that was need and part of that was interest. Yeah. Um, but a lot of, that's something. Yeah. I think a lot of people do that though, and they're still not always fare well in the transition. You know? No, but I think the point is for me, at least from my perspective, just seeing the way that you've always had a very strong emphasis on relationship dynamics, being fascinated by those, doing that kind of mm-hmm. work. And then you were in several significant long-term relationships before ours, whereas I had never, I mean, that was part of my big transition at, we're talking late twenties that I was like, oh, I've got this relational circuit coming on. I've never had a real quote unquote real partnership what would that mean to actually be committed and step into that? Our marriage was actually my first foray into that level of attachment and commitment. So that was also a very big difference. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's a piece in here that, that came up or the thought that came to me, there's a, there's a point and it is weird to reference the author's book while I'm talking to the author, but there's a (laughs) section in poly secure that, that this kind of came to me, which is around, the security that a lot of us put on the relational structure, right? We're married, therefore yeah. we're safe. We're doing this, therefore we're safe. And and it strikes me, right, that David, you growing up, you had the world of we don't get divorced, we get married, we stay married, we're safe, versus Jessica saying, I could see people come and go. And the love transcended that, the love yeah. of this this father figure lasted after the relationship with her mother ended and so the you could you experienced love in a very love and connection in a very different way that was very independent of the relational structure and ecosystem that was like telling you what to do you were sort of subverting that the whole time yeah that's a great point because i never felt like i had the privilege of those structures to rely on growing up they just didn't exist Right. And then, so when we opened up and that structure changed from monogamy to polyamory, it, yeah, it seemed it was really hard on you, Dave, of just like a lot of suddenly we thought he always would have been more securely attached, a little avoidant, you know, was now just anxiously attached in a way that was surprising. I mean, it was shocking for both of us. We're like, what's happening? (laughs) Yeah. 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 Well, and two, you've both highlighted, as you kind of said, kar- karmic connection, right? So you're you're now threatening that. the most intense connection you've ever felt in your life mm-hmm. by opening it up to potential risk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even though you both want to do that and choosing it, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily make it easy. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is one of the true gifts too of PolySecure is it's really opened up so many people's eyes to the importance of the concept of attachment theory and the way that it's not something to be underestimating. Um, I think it's a mechanism that, you know, life is programmed into us for a very good reason and it's powerful. <laughs> and we don't really understand it until you start fucking with it. And so I think we started really tapping into that. And I had no idea because I'd never experienced, because I hadn't had any exposure to that level of forming an attachment, primary attachment, emotional attachment with somebody before Jessica, really, besides my folks looking back, I'm like, Oh, this is what I was avoiding in my late teens and twenties was forming an emotional attachment. Cause I didn't feel secure enough to do that or felt mature enough to do that. So the irony of that for me, I think, again, coming from that secure um, base with my folks is that I really had no concept of jealousy and what that would mean in the way that sex was so intermingled Mm -hmm. with love and what that meant for me or the way I saw being a man. Uh, And then like once that started going outside of the house, it was just primal panic. I mean, that's, that's the only way to describe it. Like I was turning into an animal. I mean, that's the way it felt. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for touching on like this all because I, it's so common. And I I just think that people 
especially if you have all the conversations, you're like, we're on the same page. This is going to be great. And then you jump in and it's like, oh, you don't, like you said, you, I didn't even know, you didn't even know what was happening to you. Like it, why is this happening to me? Right. I can't put these pieces, like my logical side of my brain can't put these pieces together right now. Yeah. And I think too, there is a piece, um, to speak about your experience more, Dave was, you know, both. I mean, I would say you were the most evolved man I knew. And so for the most evolved man I knew, you know, and you identified with not being a typical guy, right. In, in the competitive toxic masculinity archetype way. So to now be having like jealousy, it was embarrassing, right? It was like your identity was like, I'm not that guy. So there was a lot of that to grapple with as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think one thing that's important too to name for, for other people that are potentially listening to this is it's not just, this is not something that affects people who are transitioning from monogamy into non-monogamy. This actually can happen. These kinds of primal panic experiences can happen for seasoned um you know, people, people who've been living in a non-monogamous lifestyle for years, it really just depends on the very sort of nuanced relationship structure that you're in. Like one relationship can trigger it while many others don't. It just takes that one. And then it's just like, what, how could this be happening? I've been doing this forever. I've always identified as this. And when it starts to happen to you, you're just like, what is this? And again, I think that's why poly secure was so important is because it's like, it's just given people a name for something that affects everyone that's gone through extreme um, crisis points in their non-monogamous journey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what's what's really fascinating about it, too, is you, as we kind of talked about, you two were sort of that support system for each other going through these types of relationships before you officially created the structure. Yeah. And that seemingly was even okay. That didn't call, that didn't call back to this primal panic. But yet once the the dynamic, once the container shifted for the two of you, that became an that seems to have then come up, which is just two people doing r- l- roughly the same thing over a period of years at different phases and different containers elicits very different experiences. It's it's just really I mean, to me it's really fascinating. Yeah. And um I uh, just appreciate the vulnerability both of you about Mm -hmm. talking about it because it's not easy to talk about how hard this shit can be. Yeah. No, for sure. And I think that's part of why we're doing this work and wanted to write this book is wanting to normalize this experience. And so the more that we can talk about what's really hard about it, the more that people don't feel isolated in the experience. Um, And I think that's really critical for, you know, just kind of giving people more resources yeah. um, I, that I wish I had had access to when this was happening to us. I wish I had understood more about these, you know, attachment and, and the ways in which your partner now stops being a support system. Like that starts to create this double bind. That's really painful. Like Jessica became the source, quote unquote, you know, it's like, that's my projection on my hurt, but it's like, she's sort of becoming the source of my torment and that's the person I'm conditioned to want to go to, to process that pain. That's really intense. Like that phenomenon in and of itself is so difficult. And then if you don't have a large community of people externally that are really on board with your ch- lifestyle choice and you, you know, what's worse is when you feel like you can't talk about it with anyone else, like that kind of isolation is just really, really crippling and really, really intense. And so that's the kind of thing where it's like, I want people to know they're not alone in that experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And I know we could we could keep diving in here, but I I'm curious for anyone listening to be like, okay, well, how did you get out of it? What did <laughs> what did what did you do? How did that how did that process go? Uh because I can imagine there's a number of people listening that are currently going through something similar. Well, when we got all the spoilers, they wound up living together. Yeah, and right? all of it. So we know <laughs> we know it's possible to at least come around, but yeah, how did it how did it play out? Oh, it played out in many different ways. I mean, immediately, um, with even in just a few weeks, it was like too overwhelming for Dave's nervous system. And we took a pause and he went down to Peru and did some medicine journey work for a month and really did like looking at what, what within him was needing to heal. Um, and Dave, you can jump in and say more about that. And then we and, you know, none of us had, neither of us had created, um, relationships. So it was okay to take a pause, you know, um, 
And then we opened up again. And then I got into a relationship pretty quickly. And you can say more, Dave, about the work that you did. But there was a point where I think we were actually, even though there were still ups and downs, we were in a sweet spot where it was like, he could go on a date. I could go on a date. We can come home and talk about it. We could process it. We could, you know, conflicts could come up in those other relationships and we can process it with each other and support each other and like what to do with that other person. So there was a sweet spot, at least from my perspective. Yeah, that's different. That's different than my perspective. Right. I, don't, yeah, I don't remember that sweet spot. Yeah, I feel that sweet spot. And then, um, and you know, I think what and what we get to into with Polly Wise is that the transition can expose all of these cracks in the foundation. So we felt like such a solid couple, which in many ways we were, but then the transition also exposed certain imbalances in our relationship around codependency. So it was like, okay, now we're dealing with anxious, you know, attachment coming up and our whole foundation shaking and the newness of dating people again and what that is personally, let alone together. And then having to be like, oh shit, what's all this codependent stuff that we didn't even think we had. So it's just a lot. Yeah. 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 It was a lot. Yeah. There was so much that we weren't seeing throughout the relationship on that level of codependency. And she and I, we, there was always sort of, it was like the one place that we never like really locked into place, I think was around romance and and sex. Like it wasn't bad in the beginning by any stretch, but it wasn't a place where we really thrived and, and were able to grow together. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think we really were holding it that way and understanding it until we started to see other people. And so I think there was something about that too, that was like, this idea that, oh, I want to make this work with us before we're really making that work with other people. And so as these things were starting to come ex- come out and get exposed in our transition, we were having a lot of tension and struggle. We were, we were more at odds than we had ever been. And it was really, there was a lot of rupturing that was starting to happen in that transition, but was really anchored in previous dynamics that predated the opening of our relationship that was really jarring that was and then that was exacerbating sort of this pl- this this disconnection or misalignment around sex and romance and so it was just making things worse and worse and worse in terms of that and being able to sort of heal that um and work on that while opening going through the ups and downs of opening and that actually to be honest ended up being too much for me Mm -hmm. Um, it was too painful and I couldn't reconcile even with all the personal work I was doing. I couldn't reconcile not us not being in a place where I wanted us to be in terms of our connection and her still having these deep attached relationships with other people. And so it was actually me that decided to get divorced because I wasn't willing to stay in the container the way that it was. It was too painful and I was doing myself too much harm. And so that was one of the hardest and most painful decisions I've ever made in my life. Mm. And now on the other side of it, I'm so grateful for it. And so, so this is some of those pieces that from the outside, you don't hear in the 30 second snippet is that year after getting divorced, like that was hell. We did it as well as I think you can do. Right. And I think we, we tried to really incur as, as little collateral damage as we could on each other and on our son. And I think we did a really good job of that. But after that year, I didn't, we didn't talk for about a year um about really anything consequential except sort of dropping off and picking up our son we were living in boulder colorado and sort of on the other sides of the city which is a small city but that was it and it took about a year of that like my nervous system needed i don't want to know anything about your process i don't want to know anything that's going on with you she was seeing somebody and in a really deep relationship at that point and i just needed space so it wasn't like we were connected and close through that whole transition And then about after a year, it slowly started to open again. And then we went through some, some interesting transformations after that point. It's so funny because I, from my perspective, I'm like, I thought I was the one that made the divorce happen (laughs) for totally different reasons. (laughs) Like for me, our ending had absolutely nothing. Our romantic ending had nothing to do with polyamory at all. Like that to me, wasn't the issue to me. The issue was like, seeing the codependent behaviors and we were 
in a pattern of I was over-functioning in some ways and Dave was under-functioning in some ways, not completely. And I was, I thought I was doing my end of trying to rewrite that and, you know, correct it and didn't feel like I was being met in that kind of work of what I needed. Yeah. And so to me, it was like, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to be in this dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny. So we have, we have very different takes on, on even the ending, but yes, we didn't talk for a year. Of course we talked, but I mean, we weren't close. And then, um, it was kind of sweet. I think we just started taking walks again. And so that allowed like our initial friendship, you know, when we first met was sort of this cosmic walk that we went on and we started to take walks again and just start to like feel our friendship again. Mm-hmm. and not just our parent, you know, commitment to each other. And then, you know, the pandemic happened too. So I think that propelled us back together and um, we left the country together. We wound up living together because of that, moved back to the States, you know, so there are all these external events too that just sort of congealed us again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the things I want to say too about that as I'm reminiscing is thinking about even though there was, and you, I don't remember when this happened chronologically, it'd be helpful to hear because I, I bet you remember when this sort of happened. But even amidst the pain of the separation and divorce, we still did the, the uncoupling ceremony. Yes, yeah. When was that in the process in terms of timing? It was at some point. That's maybe, that's a good question it might've been six or nine months after, and maybe that's what brought us back together. We, um, we didn't want to just have the legal divorce be it. And we decided that we went to Boulder Creek and we did this releasing of our wedding vows, releasing each other from the wedding vows that we made. Um, and then we did all of this appreciation for the relationship we had um, and what it brought to us in our life and our growth. And we released our rings into the Creek and then we recommitted as like human partners. Like I'm here, I've got your back in this lifetime and vice versa. And, and that was really powerful actually. Yeah. That, yeah, that was a big shift. And that was something that, you know, you had brought a lot to, and that was something I was seeing, you know, from the, the, the ayahuasca journeys that I was doing in Peru, there was just sort of this context for ritual and transition, um, that really helped sort of integrate the, the experience. And what's interesting for me reflecting on this is my current partner just did that with her now ex-husband. I mean, just weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was asking, you know, what did you all do? I remember you mentioned this, like, you know, so she was getting that, um, sort of structure for me. And I just, I attended it. It was so powerful. I was having so many memories of us and what we did. And yeah, it was, it was very moving. And it's, it's something that I've led clients through, um, is decoupling, like how to sort of quote unquote consciously uncouple. And to me, it's something that I think I'd love to see more of culturally. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it was incredibly healing to, yeah, you don't leave it just hanging out in the, like, you know, the, the, the path I think we often see people is they hit divorce and it's two middle fingers up and you walk in opposite directions and, and you're supposed to then shit all over them the rest of your life about they're the ones who fucked you over. And this is a way to say, what, what can we create together in a very intentional way? Okay. It's not a marriage or it's not a romantic partnership or what it's not this, but what is it? And how do we how do we then agree on that new path forward? Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, I would imagine if you can bring other people into that, then you can cut out some of that. You know, you get half the friends, I get half the friends. You get half of this, I get half of this. Like it's, hey, we're a team still. Like we're not, we're not that same team. We're a different structure, but we're still a team. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think so. And I think I think that's where. I think the origins of, of poly wise really emerged because you have to have an infrastructure of thought to do that. You have to have a value system and the edifice of a way of thinking to even step into that. Like what are the ways to conceive of a person with whom you've just gone through a divorce that aren't the classic adversary, 
you know, bonfire of the vanities kind of stereotype, right? And unfortunately, that's still the stereotype that dominates uh, at least our the culture that we live in, right? The society that we live in. So, how do we actually start building? And constructing that that infrastructure of a new way of thinking about human beings in our lives with whom we've had really significant ruptures. Um, how do we do that and sort of offer that as an alternative? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also having our shared love for our son. I mean, unfortunately, this isn't always the case for divorcing couples, right? They have kids and yet they still are pretty nasty and they might have done certain levels of harm that you and I just never did towards each other. You know, we were, right. but we weren't causing certain levels of harm, but really the, the commitment and love for our son also kept us like, you know, what we do here matters to him and we don't want to create a mess here for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think thankfully we never grew up with the kind of trauma that leads people to do that kind of thing, you know? And, yeah. and so I feel really blessed that we've made individual choices for the way that we want to live. And, you know, it's like, I hear people's stories and I understand why that happens, but I I wish that there was, there was at least a counter narrative to what can ruptures and breakups and and separations look like in a way that's not, yeah. Like having so much damage on so many different people, especially the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I'm curious about something in here because, and, and, you said like you didn't do the damage and you didn't have the trauma that could, that, that maybe led to that. But I, there's a part in here that I'm curious about, which again, we have differing perspectives on what was the catalyst for the divorce. But, but David, from your perspective, it was, you got to a place of, I couldn't do this container. I was doing too much harm to myself, but also having an extreme sort of anxious attachment being able to pull the plug on something, especially a relationship, and say, I have to transition this relationship when your body is saying, like, get closer, get closer, get closer. How, I'm just, how, how are you able to, because f- those are very counter, right? The, the, the anxious attachment style typically would say, doesn't matter how bad this gets. I cannot end it. I cannot go anywhere. We must get closer. And I think that is often where that damage starts to happen because mm-hmm. You both recognize we probably shouldn't be here, but I can't go anywhere. Yeah. I'm just stuck. And then then the fires start burning. Yeah. No, I love that you're you're sort of zeroing in on that. And, you know, it, it's an invitation for me to be even more vulnerable in my process around that. I think, like I said, I didn't have, up to that point, I had no context for understanding attachment theory, you mm-hmm. know, and it was something that as we were, literally as we were going through this this rocky transition that you were starting, you were integrating more and more, Jessica. And so I remember after just one of the most, one of the most egregious sort of um, exchanges that we had after she was leaving to go on this agreed upon uh, ex- overnight experience with one of her partners, she came back, you know, I was apologizing for what I had said and done. And then she was like, I don't even want to have a conversation with you until you've read the description of the anxious attachment. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> You did. And she's, Jessica's great. You know, she's classic Aries, like, you know, don't fuck with me. Um, you know, it's like, she's good until you push too much. And then it's like, whoa, that's scary. Um, and so you listen. And so that's what makes her a great therapist too. So I'm grateful for that mechanism, even though it's terrifying to be on the, the sort of the firing end of it. But she said that I took it seriously. I read it and I was just like, Oh, You know, it's like, I'm a robot. Like I couldn't believe it was like pretty much everything on the list was checked off. And I was just like, Oh no. And I remember having that experience the first time someone turned me on to the Enneagram, you know, and they were like, I think you're a five. I was like, no, ain't no system out there that can tell me what I am. And then I read the description of the five, like, ah, and so (laughs) dead to rights. And so it it was like, it was, it was pretty profound, like just seeing it mapped out and relieving. I'm not crazy. I'm not a bad person. This happens to other people, even this extremity, you know, because I was doing crazy things and it's really embarrassing and it's really intense and and scary. It's really scary. Like I thought I was losing my mind. I I literally was becoming suicidal in moments. I didn't know if I was going to survive it. Like it was so rough. And so to have that 
as a point of reference really changed in it. So I knew that I needed specific help. And so I committed to do this series for myself. I had moved out, was staying with some friends and I did a series of four weekend LSD journeys. Um, and I'm not saying that this is what everyone should do. This is just what I did because I had had a lot of experience with, with, um, psychedelics and the way those can be transformative. And so I was committed to seeing what is at the heart of this anger that I'm holding towards Jessica. And it wasn't until, and so I was locking myself in a room and just like, I'm not leaving this room till I get the answer to like, why is this so difficult? Why I'm being consumed by this anger? Cause I was like intimating that this is not really about her. I knew it on some level, but just couldn't overcome that mechanism. And on the third session, I was like, Oh my God, I'm trying to make another human being, essentially a woman responsible for my existence. I'm unconsciously wanting her to take care of me. That's what all this has been about. That's what all our codependence is about. Oh my God. And it was just like the anger broke, like the, you know, I was still, there was still pain, but it was just like something really changed in me. And I was able to like really let go of the, the attachment at that point and recognize that my own well being wasn't going to be predicated on whether or not we stayed together, but on me taking care of myself based on what my needs were in that moment. And that allowed me to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank I'm you. So grateful that you're able to talk about these things in a way that I, yeah, I just, yeah. your vulnerability is impressive and we appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to hear that part of it again too. And I think that's where to me, it's like that ending, that iteration of our relationship to me, it wasn't polyamory. It was actually, to me, that was the root of the dynamic that, I was also like, this isn't healthy for me, you know, and, and even having our son was a big part of it because once, mm -hmm. you know, I, we had our son, I realized I'm parenting everyone in my family I'm parenting my parents and parenting, you know, <laughs> parenting my friends and parenting you like, fuck all of that. I'm just parenting my child who I'm supposed to be the parent to. And so I was shedding a lot of this over functioning and over caretaking I was doing and rescuing. Yeah. And really, you know, getting at the roots of that behavior in myself. Yeah. And I mean, that was the interesting thing about our dynamic too, is like, you know, you, you developed that caretaking and we talk about this in the book, like you, you developed the need to caretake people to find love. And I developed like needing to the be dependency. caretaken, yeah. the dependency. And, and I have, you know, I've had a really significant autoimmune condition that made that easy, you know, that sort of like was kind of, you know, like neurotransmitter into receptor sort of hand to glove situation. Yeah. And so it really fed that. And so it was the birth of our son. And I've heard this too. It's like the best way to find out what's not working in your relationship is to have kids or open up your relationship. And we did both um, sequentially. And it was, it was the detonator. And I, so I think for me, because I felt like we weren't getting to, there was no, there wasn't enough connection and, and intimacy between us to really work those things out in the container we were in. And so for yeah. me, that's why I was like, I, I need to just jettison this thing mm -hmm. and yeah. see what's what on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for everything. As Finn said, like, we just really appreciate you sharing and we can also, could also relate to reading things about what your like personality and then be like, no, that's not me. And then you read it and you're like, Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sometimes it How does he know? <laughs> yeah, I was. It was funny you mentioned the Enneagram, Dave. Like, we had an experience. We did an any a series of Enneagram episodes, and uh -huh. when we did those, we actually had to stop the recording because I was crying because I had never heard anybody speak out loud the things that I say to myself. Mm -hmm. And this ran, this person who didn't know me at all was like, and you probably think this, this, and this, and you have a voice that says this, this, and this. And I was like, oh, I thought we all had that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it changed my world. And, and I know right, there's some people who say, well, Enneagram is just like horoscopes. And it's and, okay, sure, maybe it is. But like, it it's pretty, pretty fucking accurate horoscope for me. <laughs> totally. And so I'm okay if it helped me understand myself better. Um, mm -hmm. It's a tool for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What's your number? I am a very hard one. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of... And I'm a nine. A lot of perfectionism rolling around in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Hence why it took so long to get our audio situated before <laughs> we <hit> record. 
<laughs> How about you, Jessica? What number are you? I test is a nine. Nine too. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of five and four. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But for me, even though um, me, the Myers Briggs describes me the best, mm-hmm. whereas then I like to look at everyone else through the Enneagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, but, yeah. I love that. That's so interesting. That yeah, one is like. <laughs> depending on what, how you read it and what one, one resonates with you differently than others. Yeah. yeah. She just likes it cause her type is supposedly the rarest. So You're it makes her feel special. Because I'm more special on the Myers-Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm supposedly the second most rare and she's the most rare. And it's just like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. I'm, I love that. There's still some healthy competition. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. I know that we could talk to both of you for a long time and I, I want to be respectful of your time. Do you, first of all, did I, before I continue, do you want to jump in? No, I think what I would love to do at some point is to, if you're both willing at some point to have you both back on, we talked a lot about the sort of the uh, dismantling, the transitioning out of what you built. And I think I would also love to spend more time on the rebuilding process because I think that that's also not a story that gets told very often, right? Again, it's everybody goes to their separate corners and never talks again. And and I appreciate that we talked about it a little bit, but just that, that process of picking up the pieces, feeling betrayed, feeling abandoned, all of the things that can come up in these moments and then to piece them back together. And the puzzle probably doesn't look anything like it looked before you took it apart. Yeah. But yet it's a puzzle that is now working for you two in a different way. Well, and that's where I was going to, I agree that we should have a further conversation if, at some point, if you both are open to it, but I uh, wanted to see if you could kind of summarize as much as you can, kind of where you're at right now, as far as like your relationship and re- other relationships, just to, mm-hmm. for some context. Yeah. We, so we live together and our son lives with us and um we each have significant partners that live outside of the house and they also have kids, right? So we kind of have this mirror image of, of our relationships right now. And it seems like a real sweet spot, you know, cause we have all the advantages of, of nesting, of co-parenting. And then this last year we took on the creative project of co-writing this book, which we had done writing projects before, but this was the first like, you know, an actual book is a big deal, um, to write together. Yeah. And so, and then, you know, we have these very close partners that are come and go stay at the house, you know, and we're each sort of integrating with those other families as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think another component sort of getting into the more nuanced dynamics of the relationship that I'm in I'm imagining this would be potentially interesting for some people is just, you know, after going through everything that we've been through, um, I've really gotten clear about wanting an experience of secure attachment, right. And getting clear about what that means to me. And so when I met my current partner, we're about to celebrate our one year anniversary. We were both explicitly like, we're not monogamous. Like, and we knew that going into the conversation, right. And she was, very upfront about still being married and, you know, sort of transitioning out of a different partnership outside of that. And it was great, but we were both really, as we were sort of getting the sense that, Oh, this feels significant. We really started to like want the same thing around a container. And so we've actually been very monogamish in our relationship. And we've said, we're not ready for either one of us to start looking for or being open to um, explorations of the kind that would lead to attachment formation. And so we both share kind of a, a love of kink and, and, and erotic exploration. It's something we love to do together and are slowly sort of letting that happen in other containers, even when we're not together. But it's, it's really about what does secure attachment look like for us, for our relationship, knowing that at some point that is probably going to change or not. But it's really about like what does secure attachment look like for us and really honoring that while being able to navigate a more sort of open-ended exploratory 
relationship to relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my relationship with her feels much more like a metamor relationship, not like Dave's girlfriend, you know? It's, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I see that. Right. And her and I have that intimacy of a shared partner in a lot of ways, you know, even when we talk about you versus it just being like, you know, other times that you've had girlfriends that like I'm friendly with, you know, totally. And I think part of the reason why that is, is because she's so conditioned to the structural, like I tell her about what we're doing, what we've done. And it's just like, she doesn't bat an eyes. Like she's got her own story that equals mine in the sense of like, yes, the complexity yeah. Um, and contextualize contextualization of that. And so, yeah, that's made the transition into the, the family networks on both sides much smoother. <laughs> <laughs> it's a level of empathy you can only get by living, I think, in some ways that like it sounded like Davy that, that her marriage also recently transitioned in, in all of these things. And so like you're it's the idea that we show up right to these relationships, these newer relationships, we're not the same person we were 20 years ago when, you know, you two met or when, when Emma and I met in seventh grade, I'm, I'm not that seventh grader, right? I'm not even the guy I was when we started dating our freshman year of college. Mm-hmm. And so now we're showing up in these other partnerships and it's like, well, wait, well, well who the hell is this person? <laughs> and you're like, yeah. That's that's 30 years of of experiences in life and developing empathy and and we just sometimes we just we can connect and relate in a different way because of we're we're not the same person anymore. And I just think that's a really powerful sort of look into that, that you're both showing up as who you are now and be uh, being able to relate with other people who have gone through what some some similar exploration mm-hmm. and they have a different empathy right i imagine if you showed up on the doorstep of somebody who's been monogamous in maybe a very strict way for a very long time and you're like here's my journey they're going to be like whoa don't i don't well, don't come near me that's way too scary but you have a different i don't know a different community than you used to have too mm-hmm yeah, and I think that's a cool thing about sort of the the proliferation of resources, you know, and access to more information and more networking opportunities is there is a way in which you can start to make these connections, depending on where you are. There's still people that are living in places where it's not even an option, unfortunately, totally. locally at least. Um, but yeah, the, like I said before, the normalization of these complex journeys is really important i think for us and again sort of one of the big impetuses for writing the book Mm -hmm. yeah speaking of that how about uh can you talk a little bit about the book about the work about the work that both of you do um we'd love to send more people your way yeah so the book came out of my question what the hell is going on (laughs) with working with my polyamorous or newly non-monogamous or very seasoned polyamorous, but there's like a relationship de-escalation or escalation, or you fall in love with someone new for the first time. Um, And just seeing all of these people who are coming really seeking support and not understanding themselves. Like, why is this happening? Like we want to do this and it still can be hard. And so I really wanted to understand Um, so it was, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of session hours with clients of trying to make sense and then doing my own qualitative research, um, interviewing people that I sort of came to, here's the best answer I have right now, you know, and that, um, other, and insecure attachment was just one of the bullet points. I had like five things like, here's what's going on. Right. And so, um, my publisher wanted us to do just an attachment book first, which we did. And then this book is the other answers of the other things that are going on. And we've already mentioned one like codependency or, um, not being able to deal with the issues of the past that you haven't dealt with before. So that's where Dave came in with restorative justice practices where the cracks in the foundation of your relationship get exposed Um, how do you make a paradigm shift? Like, I think this is one of the most underestimated, you know, things around a transition like this is this is a different paradigm 
of love, of sex, of relating, of family. And that's easier said than done. So yeah, that was kind of the origins of the book. Awesome. Yeah. David, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that's a that's a question that we've shared and I've really been fascinated by is like why as human beings do we not make conscious paradigm shifts? Like why do we stumble into the next phase of evolution? Like what what I feel like we have the opportunity to sort of start to create that infrastructure consciously, so why don't we do it? Um and so we need people that have done it to create that for us. And so it's interesting to you, like she said, sort of the experience of our clients to lay that groundwork for a model that then can be offered. But really like, how do you operate at that level? How do you make changes at the level of paradigm? So it's not just you feeling like you're swirling in your chaos, but just like you're able to start contextualize it in these kind of outwardly moving concentric circles. And so anchoring your understanding of your journey seeing it as part of a collective journey, I think makes it just more tenable in so many ways. So I think it was a question that I was really fascinated by. I'm a five on the Enneagram. So I love the philosophy. I love the intellectual blending that happens when Jessica and I've worked together, we've worked together on writing projects before and just knowing that we have a lot of good symbiosis there. Um, it's just easy and fun. It's just fun to work together. Um, so I can't believe as a five, you said fun. I know I'm not supposed to, it's not, a word, but I think my new relationship has been helping me integrate that. And, um, I'm changing. <laughs> I was going to say, I know, I know for myself, the reason those new paradigms are so hard is because they got to be perfect before it's time to step into it. You have to perfect them, right? <laughs> you know me so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm really excited to read the book because, yes, you know, I think th- again, as many amazing things as Poly Secure brought, I think there was a piece that I felt often was people now point to attachment and they're like, well, we're having issues. It has to be because of attachment, right? And it's like, yeah, there's that's one leg of a table that has multiple legs. And it, yeah, it's definitely <laughs> part of it. Like totally. <laughs> Totally. But not the whole thing. Right? That's a great point. Right. And that was the origins of it is it's it's not just the attachment leg or lens. Yeah. There's other lenses to look through that that's what polywise brings to the table. Is here's the other yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Yeah. Links for the listeners to the book will be in the show notes, of course. Um, is there anything else either about your work or anything else that you, either of you wanted to get out there today? And Dave, I want to maybe too to give you just a highlight a, a minute to talk about your sort of personal work. You said working with clients as well. Um, I think th- this is a great spot to, to pitch that as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm really specialized in conflict and bring a restorative model. I spent years working for um, a restorative justice nonprofit in Colorado. And so cut my teeth on the restorative concept there and was just really blown away by what's possible in the restorative space in terms of using conflict as a springboard for just amazing, not just reconciliation, but even personal transformation. And so I think the inspiration for me um, after getting burned out on the institutional level was recognizing, and this actually emerged through some pretty powerful conversations with Jessica, you know, she was naming you gotta be, I was kind of in a hiatus phase and she was saying, and I was starting to talk about wanting, missing the work and needing a shift. She's like, why don't you take that restorative model? I've got clients that really need sort of a very specific thing, you know, that around just communication dynamics that are conflictual inherently uh, or dealing with past ruptures that are still continuing to linger and cause problems. Why don't you use the restorative method? And so I was sort of researching that and I was sort of blown away, but no, I wasn't seeing anyone there may be now, but I hadn't, wasn't seeing anyone use it for intimate relationships outside of the context of courts and schools. And like I said, institutions. So it was kind of exciting. So she, you know, kind of announced me to the community as an option and people really responded pretty quickly. And I think one of the things that draws people to me is one, it's not therapy and there's a lot of people that are wanting an alternative and they're wanting something that feels really practical, skills-based and sort of applicable in the immediate for their crises. 
And, and the restorative method is really that. And I think a lot of people are also starting to perk their ears up to the restorative concept and being like, that resonates. There's something about the need for acknowledgement and taking accountability and not just sort of expecting forgiveness and washing over things that really is resonating. And I think rightly so. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just been a lot of fun to create this model, put it out there and see the response. Um, and I think a lot of people in the communities that, um, identify or relate in some way to ethical nominami really resonate with the model, um, for various reasons. So it's just been, it's just kind of been a serendipitous, um, positive outgrowth of, of this journey that we've taken. And now that I'm really focused on. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that. And I can totally see how it's really useful and how like two intimate relationships. Why? I mean, Oh yeah. It seems obvious, but I can understand why it's hard to make that transition too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, that's one of the things we, I'm sorry to cut you off. It's, okay. it's one of the things I talk about in the book is, is that's not the only, the only paradigm shift we need to make is not from monogamy to non-monogamy, but also how do we move from an adversarial when it comes to conflict, how do you move from an adversarial paradigm to a restorative paradigm? You know, and, and I think because we've sort of been steeped in this society with a paradigm of, of criminal justice, which is punitive in its essence, that's actually in a lot of ways trickled down into our romantic and emotional relationships. Like we are, unfortunately, I think, conditioned to see our partners when we feel hurt as the enemy. And if that's our starting point, we're doomed. And so we actually do have to make another kind of paradigm shift when we're talking about conflict. And that's something that I talk specifically in, in chapter four about is how do you make that paradigm shift or restorative paradigm? Yeah. Uh, anything else, I guess. Thank you for explaining that. I think it's amazing, by the way. And I'm, as Finn said, I'm also really excited to read the book and uh, spread the word. Uh, do Jessica, do you have anything else you want to add? No, that's it. It's great. Okay. Thank you both for the wonderful conversation today. I know, as we said a little while ago, we'd love to have you back on and kind of talk about that reparative structure uh, because I, that's a super important and really hard thing to do too. Just on the off chance that anybody's non-monogamous relationship hits a bump <laughs> or maybe transitions, just hypothetically speaking, of course. Right. <laughs> Not speaking from experience at all. <laughs> um yeah. Thank you both again, just for your vulnerability today, the conversation, we really, really appreciate it. And for the work you do as for well. the work that all of the work that you've both done. Yeah. yeah well, thank you both for a, you. a really awesome conversation. Good containers. It was fun. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. I love it. Thank you. I love it. And I think too, is amazing just for, for behind the scenes. <laughs> If you haven't even listened to the podcast, you had no idea what you were doing here. You're just like, I don't know. I'm here to have a conversation. And it was incredibly powerful. So I love that. I think that's amazing. No, thank um, you. You made, yeah. it e you made it easy. Yeah. Thank I you. appreciate it. We, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, have have a wonderful Labor Day. We're celebrating. We're, we're interviewing on Labor Day. So have a wonderful Labor Day. And we will talk to you all soon. Yeah, we look forward Bye. to it. Bye. Bye-bye. And we're back. Thank you again, Jessica and David, for everything, the vulnerable conversation, and for all of the work that you do. A reminder, go to the links in the show notes, check out their work, buy the new book, Polywise. We would love to hear your feedback on what you think as well. And just thank you again, Jessica and David. Yeah, I'm just echoing Emma once again. I, I feel like I do that a lot. You say <laughs> lots of good stuff, so I'm just going to echo it. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jessica and David, for your vulnerability in showing up here and sharing I, I'm just super grateful anytime we're able to have, first of all, anybody be vulnerable with us, but authors who have written some of the, I would say the, the books, I mean, I don't know that there's a book that's been mentioned more in our podcast than Poly Secure, perhaps The Ethical Slut, mm -hmm. but to, to have people who write these incredible resources come on and then vulnerably share about their experiences, I think it, it adds just another layer of I don't want to credibility, but just impact to these stories. Yes. A quick reminder, our upcoming virtual meet and greet for November is on November 17th. You can sign up at our website. And while you're there, go and listen to the Ask Us Anything episode that dropped last Friday, it's October 27th, where Finn and Miche answer some of your questions. And be on the lookout in the end of November for the next episode of that 
and, person. And be on the lookout for you sending us questions so we can answer them. Please send us your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we have an interview with Mariana. It is lovely. We're excited to get it out there. And I think that's it. That is pretty much all I think we have to say today. So, thank you. Yes. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.